Scripture reading is Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version Bible. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Please be seated. Mark your songbooks at 584. 584. Good evening to you. What a great joy it is to be with you, even after you tried to kill me by feeding me so much stuff today. That was a terrific time. I really enjoyed getting to be with you, eat some food with you, and laugh and joke with you, and just get to know you a little bit better. And I'm just thrilled to be here with you folks. You've made such a tremendous impression. I will take some of you back with me, even if you can't physically go back with me. I will be taking uh, my memories of you and all the things that you're doing. You're doing so many things right. This church is just doing so many things right. And uh, you should be happy about that. And just remember that there's always something more that we can do, and we're going to continue to grow and do what it is the Lord wants us to do as time goes on. I do want to talk to you tonight about thinking big. I'm going to use that passage that was in our reading, Matthew the 16th chapter, and maybe for a different reason than we normally would use that passage. This is a classic scenario where Jesus has asked His disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say that there are different opinions. He says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, of course, you're the Christ, you're the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you. Heaven revealed that to you. On that confession, that idea that I am in fact the Christ, I will build my church. Gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. You bind it on earth, it will be bound in heaven. Just very important stuff, isn't it? Then we get to this part where Jesus reveals in such explicit terms what has to happen to Him in order for God's plan of salvation to come about. What Peter thinks of as an unthinkable thought has to happen. If Jesus does not die if He does not go into Jerusalem, if He is not crucified, what happens? No one will ever be saved. Salvation will be unavailable to mankind. And my question for you is, is that what God wants? God, 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Isn't that right? And God, through Jesus' mouth, says, That He loves the whole world so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. That is what God wanted to happen. Isn't that right? And if Jesus doesn't do that, how can anybody be saved? So it's within that context that we see this passage, verse 23 of Matthew 16. He turned and said to Peter. Now why is He talking to Peter? He's talking to Peter because Peter's always talking. He's talking to Peter because Peter's the first one to speak up. When Jesus has a question, guess who's going to always answer it? And once in a while, don't you get the picture that once in a while, Jesus turns to Peter and looks at him and like, that was a rhetorical question. (laughs) Really didn't mean for you to answer that out loud, Peter. But Peter's always eager to answer. When Peter says what he says, No way! You're not going to Jerusalem. You're not going to be beaten or crucified or mistreated. You kind of get the feeling that Peter's standing there with his fist clenched. He goes, they'll have to go through me first. Isn't that right? Isn't that the way you'd feel about it? Oh, you come after Jesus. The line starts right here. You come through me first. Isn't that what Peter's saying? I want you to see the language Jesus reserves for him. All the things that Jesus ever says to Peter. This is the worst thing Jesus ever says to anybody. 
This is the strongest language Jesus ever used against a human being. Peter says, not so, Lord. That shall not happen. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You're unmindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Wow. Jesus called somebody Satan who wasn't Satan. He called one of his best friends on the earth Satan and told him he was offensive to him. What could provoke Jesus to say such a thing as that? It's that next statement. Peter, you're thinking too small. Your vision is too narrow. Why is that? Because what Peter is thinking is, I'm about to lose the best friend I've ever had. I'm about to lose the most important person in my life. I'm about to lose the best teacher I've ever met. I'm about to lose the most amazing friend. The most accomplished speaker. I'm about to lose this person who's so significant to who? Peter! And Peter is not saying, not so, Lord. They'll, they'll have to go through us to get through. He's not saying that as a great defense of Jesus. He's not saying that as Jesus' friend saying, oh, well, they'll... What he's saying is I cannot imagine my life without you. You mustn't do that. I need you here. You've changed everything for me. I've got to have you right here with me. You mean the world to me. That's what he's doing. And Jesus is saying God's plan is that I die. It's God's plan because that will save people, Peter. That must happen. That If nothing else happens, that has to happen. But Peter couldn't see it because Peter was thinking too small. Peter was mindful of the things of men. Do you ever do that? I've only been with you twice. But I've seen something that I see everywhere I go. We're comfortable and you know how I can tell we're comfortable? You sit in the exact same spot every time you're here. Right? That seat has sort of taken your shape. <laughs> that makes sense. We have a whole company that produces chairs for us. That we call lazy boy. <laughs> we are all about some comfort. We have a whole branch of food that is artery clogging that we call comfort food. We have shoes and insoles for those shoes. Everybody wants to talk to you about comfort. Your beauty rest mattress or your Tempur-Pedic mattress, everybody, comfort. We've got to be comfortable. If you're not comfortable with an office chair, you've got to be, it's got to be ergonomic enough to keep you awake but comfortable enough that you can sit there for long enough to do all the things that they want you to do. Comfort, 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 comfort. Be comfortable. We have doctors whose whole career will be based on pain management. What does that mean? That means they're there to keep you comfortable. Now let me tell you something. If over the next year you added 50 new Christians to this church, nobody here is going to get to be comfortable. Number one, you've got to change the way you sit in this building. There can't be anybody on the ends and you've got to cram together. Because there's not enough room for 50 people, especially if five families are within that group of you know, four people. Five families of four people come in amongst that 50 people. Do you think they want to break up and sit in different places in this building? Well, you all already know each other. Sit together. Let those families sit together when they show up. Listen, this is what I'm going to tell you. And this is what we've got to get out of our heads. My comfort cannot even be my second consideration or my third consideration. My number one consideration is the things of God. What does God want? What does God want this church to be doing? What does God want me to be doing? I will rest and be comfortable when I'm up there. I will be comfortable when my works go to follow me. That's when I get to be comfortable. I will sleep when I'm dead. Maybe you've heard that. That's exactly the picture the Bible paints. I'll sleep when I'm dead. 
What if I told you this church needs to be bigger? What would you say? Oh, amen. That's what I want to hear. Would you believe that? I, what I really want us to do is get something out of our minds. I am sick to death of this. And I, I, I joke sometimes, but I'm deadly serious about this. I'm sick to death of going to places or talking to guys on the phone or families in different places and hear that we've taken this mentality that we're just defending the little hill that God has given us. We're just hoping we don't lose anything else. We're just keep, keeping house. We're doing the best we can, kind of keeping things clean. Oh, I just hope we, hope we don't lose anybody this year. I just, oh, we're just, oh, oh. This is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. This is the people of God, the soldiers of Christ. This is part of the everlasting kingdom delivered by the blood of Jesus into our hands. We take ground. That's what we do. We go out into the community and we seize territory that the devil has taken and we get it back. That's what we do. We go to war on His turf. And we make Him feel the presence of God in this community. See, that's what the church is supposed to do. But we've got to get out of that cycle of small thinking or poor old me or poor little us. We cannot get that into our heads. We've got to start thinking big. And what's going to do is for us to not get hung up on a couple of things. Oh, it's so easy for us to get hung up on results. What does 1 Corinthians, the third chapter and verse 6 tell us? The principle there, regardless of the names, whether it's Paul and Apollos, Paul and Silas, or Paul and Barnabas, or Peter and John, or whoever, one plants, one waters, and God gives the increase. You see all the roles there? Seed scatterer, waterer. And within that is an understanding that the soil has its own role to play. Is that true? Okay. Who is it that gives the increase? God gives the increase. Whose business are the results? God's. So what we need not to do, first of all, is to think small and start looking at people based on the shell or the package that they come in and say, that person can be or can't be a Christian. That person is or is not a good prospect for the gospel. Uh, this person looks to me like they would be a good Christian. We just love to pick the right ones, don't we? Oh, this person here, you know, middle class and regular folks, and they look like they make a good Christian. They could probably make a regular contribution. Well, yeah, they look pretty normal. And we walk past people all day long. Oh, Muslim. Nope. Oh, that guy's an atheist. Forget it. Oh, that lady there gets around. Oh, that guy's pothead. That guy drinks like a fish. And we look at those people and say, hmm, yeah, those probably aren't very good prospects. What are you talking about? Those are the prospects. Who needs the gospel worse than them? Don't you worry about the results. Don't you worry about it. The gospel will work on the people it will work on. And it really doesn't matter what you think about it. It is God who gives the results. And this is where someone usually says, listen, now listen, listen. People talk about the church getting bigger and all that kind of stuff. You know, bigger doesn't mean healthier. Bigger churches where people are, they just kind of go there and they just fade into the woodwork. They just don't want to be bothering them. They just kind of sit along the periphery and nobody messes with them. That's why they go to those big churches. Because, you know, big churches, they can't be doctrinally sound, of course, obviously. <laughs> that many people, you can't control what's going on there. The first church was enormous. On the first day of the first church, it was 3,000 people. About a chapter and a half later, later it's 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. Tell me one more time how the church can't be big and be healthy. Tell me one more time. And we will go to Acts 4. We'll go to Acts 5 and you'll eat it. Ask for salt with it because it's coming. 
It's coming. And I'm telling you, the truth of it is, what we are is scared. And the reason we're scared is because we're thinking about us. We are the resources. And we're thinking, well, maybe if we had us a Paul and a Peter and a whoever else and all that list of the twelve, and we'd even take a Matthias. We don't know anything about that guy, but we'd take him. He was listed among those twelve, right? What we need is something like that. No! What we need is to be mindful of the things of God rather than the things of men. The only reason we don't succeed at the level that the first century church did is because we're too comfortable. The resources are too comfortable. We've got too many irons in the fire. We're way too concerned about our own comfort, our own interests, our own hobbies, our own pursuits, our own money, our own stuff, our own houses, our own clothes, our own just us. So I look at this number before me and I say to myself, this is a whole lot more than Jesus started with. And his group evangelized a planet. We'll talk more about that in a minute. I want to spend just the next couple of minutes, I'll be honest, it's more than a couple. I want to spend the next couple minutes here talking with you about reasons not to get hung up on the resources. We'll start way back in the book of Genesis. There was a man once upon a time that God promised, make a great nation out of you. I'll give that nation a land to live in and I'll cause the nations of the earth to be blessed through your descendants. And when he told that guy those things, that guy was old and childless. He and his wife had never had children. And the very first time he hears anything about that, he's about 75. By the time he starts having kids, he's pushing the century mark. And every one of us, without fail, every one of us would be thinking, I think you've got the wrong Abraham. You're looking for a young guy and his wife who haven't started their family yet. But Hebrews 11th chapter and verse 12 says, Therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. You see, God trumps numbers. God specializes in surmountable odds. That's His thing. That's what He does all the time. That's where He absolutely flourishes. And you can see it in other situations. There was a nation of slaves that he said, I'll make you free from this and I'll take you to be my own people and I'll establish a covenant with you. And he sends Moses to deliver them from the Egyptians. The greatest empire that the earth had seen to that point. Powerful people, wealthy Well armed. And so the people are thinking, we're a slave nation. They don't even let us keep the bricks we make. We don't have any weapons. We have no training in warfare. How are we supposed to do this? And God showed them, I can do whatever I want to do. And I don't even need people to do it. And through those ten plagues, God decimates the greatest empire on the planet. And those people beg the Israelites to leave and pay them to do it. In Exodus, the third chapter, verse 19, it begins, So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. They walk out of Egypt. Again, we don't always picture this the right way. I think we get the idea that the Israelites walked out with maybe a ring on each, you know, one one ring on a finger and maybe a couple of earrings in their pocket. And that was the plunder. I'm telling you, folks, they walked out of their filthy, stinking rich. That's how they left. They, They started as slaves. And when they left, they left as the conquering hero nation of wealth. 
to go out in that wilderness. And in Deuteronomy, the 31st chapter, they're given a command to review that story every seven years in great detail. In Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter says, when you have a king, it is his responsibility to have his own copy of these scriptures so that he can review that story, so he can see. Do you know what the point of that is? That every so often they'd be reminded of this. It doesn't matter what's against you as long as God is for you. And when God is on your side, He will take care of what you cannot take care of. And He will deal with the odds that are too great for you to match. And He will do the fighting that you are not equipped to do. God does that. He does those kinds of things. And so when they go to this land that He's been promising all the way back to the time of Abraham, the very first display He makes is Jericho. And what is it that they have to do? they got to take several walks. That's what they have to do. That's all there is to it. And then God causes the walls to fall down flat right before them. wasn't anything they did. Please don't mistake this. There was no sonic boom. That wasn't what the trumpets did. It wasn't what the shouting accomplished. That was God doing all of that. And they could walk straight away into the city and do all of those things. But do you remember how that whole thing started? They sent in those spies. And they come back and they say, oh, it's great. We're just never going to have it. (laughs) And thus the people rebel. And they refuse to go in. But way back in the book of Deuteronomy, this is the way the Lord told them to see it. Chapter 9, verse 1. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself. Cities great. And fortified up to heaven. People great and tall. The descendants of the Anakim. Whom you know and of whom you heard it is said. Who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore understand today that the Lord your God. Is he who goes over before you. As a consuming fire. He will destroy them. And bring them down before you. And so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly. As the Lord has said to you. Do you see the reality that God paints in that picture? He says, I knew they were giants. I knew they were warriors. I know all of those things. I'm super well acquainted. I'm not blind. But I'm telling you, you're going to take it from them. The people who refused didn't, but the people who later come in, the people that they claimed would be the victims were the victors. Now how did that happen? God It was through obedience to God that they accomplished this tremendous feat. When you get over to the stories of the judges, the man Gideon has to face these Midianites. Oh my, they're terrible people. He puts together an army. The first thing he does when God says that's too many, he says, anybody who's scared, by all means, you go home. And a big bunch of them said, yeah. They took off immediately because they were scared. And you would be too. It makes good sense to be scared. These were pretty frightening people. And he reduces it even further. He gets it down to the number. God says, that's too many. Reduce it again. And he has them drink. And he ends up with 300 guys against an army of thousands. And this is what the Lord says about it. Judges 7, 7. The Lord said to Gideon, By 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. What is the point there? The point is, had it been many more than 300, the men might have thought, Listen, we're pretty tough. We're bad dudes. <laughs> I mean, did you see what we did to the Midianites? Come here. Feel that right there. I'm bad. I'm tough. They might start thinking themselves like David's mighty men, ambidextrous, killing lions in snowy pits with their bare hands, you know. And that's not what God wanted. What God wanted them to do was to see the danger, realize the danger, and understand there was not a thing they could have done without God. That through God they could win whatever it was God said they could win. Even with just 300 men. 
It was a number that they would have looked at and said, impossible. Impossible! Do we understand that tonight? If you had taken 300 men against the army of the Midianites and that's all you had, you would have asked for conditions of peace. You would have asked to have been their slaves. You would have asked for something different than war because you would have known 300 against the Midianites. No way. It's strictly impossible. Would you agree with that? And yet they did it. Now how did that happen? You know how it happened. This beautiful piece of... Uh, Antiquity on the right is Sennacherib's prism. And on part of that prism, he writes about how he took King Hezekiah in the city of Jerusalem, had him besieged, and he said, I had Hezekiah shut up like a bird in a cage. Now history will tell us that he had to abandon the siege at Jerusalem and go back home. It maybe had something to do with... Uh, you know, Babylonians being knocking on his back door or whatever. But you and I know what happened in Scripture. This part did not make Snacker's prism, you know, because as they say, the winners write the history. But in 2 Kings 19 and verse 35, it says, It came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. I love the Bible that it says there were all the corpses. Just in case you didn't catch it, they were all dead. What else would you expect a corpse to be? That means they were super dead. Extra crispy dead. They were all together dead. Not partly dead. Not mostly dead. There were, no Miracle Max was going to bring any of these guys back. They were gone. And how? How? The Lord did that. Why? Because they needed Him to do it. They had to be dependent on Him for that. And then, of course, the ultimate example. Jesus sends just 12 men. 12. And the command He gives them is at the very beginning of the book of Acts, in chapter 1 and verse 8. You wait. To be in, endued with power from on high in Jerusalem. And then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the outline for the book of Acts. That's exactly what happens. And these 12 men did just that. And if you and I were saying, we're going to evangelize the whole planet, would you pick more than 12 you and I would raise an army, wouldn't we? You see, that's exactly the point. That's what God has been doing with the church for all of these years. He's building an army. That's exactly our role. And folks, what we've got to do is get out of this mentality that woe is me and the little is us. Thinking that the church, the local church, in any community, is the most powerful entity in that community. Now we, we, walk, we talk about town hall, we talk about the capital, we, we talk about elections, we talk about all that kind of stuff. It's on everybody's lips. Oh, Tuesday, I cannot wait for Tuesday to come. Because it will mean an end to the commercials. Can't wait. I'm tired of listening to all of them lie about everything. Aren't you tired of that? And we waste so much of our time and energy be concerned about the things of men. And we've got to turn our eyes to the church. Look around you. Look at this room of people. Not many wise, not many noble, not many strong in the way the world have been called, but look at what we are. This is the strongest entity in this city. Why? Because the Lord is among this people. That's the way we've got to think. We are winners. We are victors. We are overcomers. Mostly what we are is the Lord's people. And the Lord's work done in the Lord's ways will never lack the Lord's support. And we've got to stop thinking small. We have to. Let me tell you why. 
Our enemies are thinking big. That little push in Houston a couple weeks ago, that's just the beginning. Man, I'm surprised that happened in Texas. All kidding aside, I joke with Bill about Texas. I'm really surprised it didn't happen in Dallas, Texas. And no one would be surprised if it happened in Dallas, Texas, or if it happened in San Francisco or someplace like that. But Houston, Texas, now that was a shock. Let me tell you, that is not the last we're going to hear of all of that kind of stuff. You send your kids to college. Listen to what they tell you about the science courses they take. There is no talk of the theory of evolution anymore. It's just evolution. It's just the fact. It's just the way it is. It's not been any more proven than it was 160 years ago. But yet it's spoken of in just hushed and reverent terms. Even though it's ridiculous and impossible, scientifically speaking, it cannot be. Especially not Darwinian or neo-Darwinian theories. They just don't enjoy any support scientifically. Now, that hasn't stopped them from thinking big. <clears throat> and I can tell you something. They've taken enormous strides in the past 20 years. All of the, the onset of homosexuality being thrown into our faces and the way that that's being done and how you're supposed to be tolerant. I'm so uh, surprised. The tolerance police trying to get us to be tolerant, they're the least tolerant people on the planet. They cannot tolerate you having a different point of view. You're a bigot. That's hate speech. No, it's an idea. Wow, lighten up. Who's, who sound like the Nazis now? Those folks have made tremendous strides. And I'm telling you, the young people among us know exactly what I'm talking about even if nobody else does. You better keep your head down on the issue of homosexuality or someone will stand up and bite it off. The issues having to do with God and creation and intelligent design, that is being pushed and shoved. That little documentary came out about 10 years ago called Expelled. talks a whole lot about scientists who are working in universities who lose their jobs because they allow for the possibility, like you know, the scientific theory would allow, that there are other hypotheses that they've allowed for the possibility that there's something greater than us out there that may have flipped a switch, may have done some stuff. Well, they're being fired. They're losing their tenure. Our enemies are thinking big. And I'm not saying uh, just kind of. They're thinking huge. They will not be satisfied until it is this huge world order where everybody just kind of falls lockstep into whatever it is that they're saying. Now, if they're thinking bigger, what does that mean for the people of God? What does that mean? Quit being quiet. Quit sitting and taking it. Stand up and do the right thing. Say what needs to be said. Tell the truth. Don't just let it go. Don't privately hold it. Publicly proclaim it. We've got to think bigger. Because they are. God thinks big. Have you ever noticed the scope of the way God says things? God so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son. The whole world. Who? He wants to save everybody. The sacrifice of Jesus, undeniably, is enough power to forgive everybody who's ever lived. There's not a place where we get to baptism number 8,466,000 and God says, Ooh, I'm sorry, we're out of forgiveness. There's enough forgiveness for every human who ever lived, who has ever lived, who will ever live. Now that's thinking big. That is exorbitant. That is very pricey. That's the way he thinks. Jesus, as we said in Acts, the first chapter, verse 8, he's thinking big. He wants them to evangelize the whole world. And I want you to get a picture of that. This is the last of those 40 days Jesus is walking on the earth. And He's talking to them. He goes, you wait in Jerusalem. You should be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And here they are. They think, oh, makes perfectly good sense. We're in Jerusalem. Sure, I can do that. In Judea and Samaria. Oh, well, that's only a little bit further from here. I mean, that spreads it out a little bit. There's enough of us. There's 12 of us. I mean, we could probably get that done in a few years. Sure. And then He jumps. And the other most parts of the earth. Well, we could probably... Did he, what did he say? <laughs> could you ask him to repeat that thing again? Peter, say something. 
But nobody says anything because it's very clear what he means. And I want you to see what they saw. They're no longer dealing with the Jesus who said, I must go into Jerusalem, I must suffer many things by the hands of the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and all those people. I must be crucified and raised again on the third day. They're not dealing with that Jesus anymore. They're dealing with the resurrected Christ. They're dealing with the King who went toe-to-toe with death and threw it down and put his foot on the neck of Satan and said, you're finished. You're finished with these people forever. I've been waiting to crush you for so long and now the day has arrived. You bruised my heel. Here I stand. That's the Jesus that says what He says in Acts 1 and verse 8. And I'm telling you, not a one of those men, 11 at that time, not a one of them, blinked when He said the uttermost parts of the earth. Because now they're dealing with the God that they suspected that He was. He's proven that He is. And when He started thinking big and talking big, all they said was, it doesn't matter if it costs us our lives. It's, it's go time. It's time to do this. Because they understood who we're dealing with. Do you understand who we're dealing with today? That's the same Jesus. That God who thinks big, God so loved the world, that's the same God who told Abraham what he did and turned him into a great nation of people. It's the same God who delivered the Israelites from the Egyptians. The same God who did what he did in the promised land. The same God who did what he did with Gideon in 300. It's the same God who killed those 185,000 Assyrians. That's the same God that we serve. And what does he say to us? Win this community. Save them. Get as many people in here as possible because I'm sending Jesus back on a day. And when he comes, that's the end. I need as many of my children to get home as I can. People are counting on us. That's another reason for us to think big. There are people in your life I will never meet. You're nice folks. But there are people in your life I will never meet. People who are your customers, your co-workers, family members. There is a circle of influence that you enjoy exclusively. It does not intersect with any of the other people in this building. It doesn't intersect with any other Christians. There's a circle of influence in which you are the only New Testament Christian some people know. Do you know what that means? Those people are counting on you to share the truth with them. They're counting on you to be the one who is the vehicle for the gospel in their lives. Because you're the only one. And if you don't do it, it just doesn't happen. We've got this mentality in our minds because, I don't know, maybe because we're Americans, I don't know, that says, well, if I don't do it, someone will get to it. Well, that might be true in almost any other field. But it's not true in this one. There are people that are your people, and they're only your people. And I'm going to tell you something. I know enough about people to know this. Some of your people, even if they met me, they wouldn't want to talk to me about the gospel. They would find me obnoxious. They would think I'm too tall or too fat or too loud or too silly, too white, too southern, too something. But you fit. You're in their lives already. You can do it. And those people are counting on you. Well, it's all about an issue perspective. Do you have the vision to see this? That there's a reality that has not yet taken place. You've got to be able to see that in the future. Do you see this church five years from now and ten years from now and twenty years from now? Do you see this church with elders? Do you see this church too full to fill this building? Uncomfortably full. We've got to build or we've got to add on or we've got to move the pews or do something. Do you see that? 
I'm telling you, see, I see the looks on some of your faces and some of you go, oh, I guess. Why not? Why don't you see that? The only reason that wouldn't be true is because we're thinking about the things of men instead of the things of God. I think God can make it a reality. I think God can make this, I think God realistically could make this the biggest church in 300 miles. And look at you looking at me. Look at you. Some of you are looking at me like, you must have drunk something before you got up there. <laughs> have you been sitting too close to the exhaust pipes out in the parking lot? You, too much carbon monoxide? Maybe you just kind of... Is that not possible? Could there not be a hundred more people, members of this church, this time next year? There's a couple of hesitant nodders here. I mean, it could be possible. Is that possible? It's up to you. Let me tell you something. I love this guy. He's neat. But if it's all up to him, there will not be a hundred more people here next year. Just because one man can't do that. But if you do it, and you do it, and you, 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 and Bill, write it down, it's happening. Because once all of you start doing that, you know who else steps in? God. And He says, uh, let me handle the impossible stuff and you all just do the legwork, okay? And lo and behold, here it is. And we're talking about this a year later. And we're all looking at that saying, well, I thought that guy was crazy. And it's not because Phil Arnold said it, it's because God wants it. It's because that's what God wants anyway. And sometimes all we need is a little push in the right direction. Brethren, you have all the skills. You have all the knowledge. You have all the personality traits. You've got all the good things that are going on. You've got a facility. You've got great people. You've got great Bible class teachers. You've got tremendously mature people. You've got everything that is needed to make this God reality happen in this place. You have it. Every element is necessary. You've got it. But you've got to see it. You've got to see it. Any young man who's here, whether you have children or don't, whether you're married or no, do you have plans to be an elder? Man, I can't tell you what the church needs in the way of leadership. Everywhere I go, everybody I talk to, there is one crisis that's facing us right this minute and it's going to be the worst thing we've got to deal with for the next 25 years. There is a dearth of leadership in God's church. You've got to do what you can do while you can do it. And someday you may be able to do it in a different capacity, but I'm going to tell you, folks, elders come from leadership. Leadership doesn't come from elders. You've got to take some responsibility to lead and take the initiative and do what you can in the circle where you can do it. You do it. God will bless it. But nothing ever happens until you take that step into the future. That's what you've got to do. That's what I have to do. It honors God to show Him we believe in that. Do you believe God's plan for the church? Do you believe God means for the church to save souls? That's His plan. Do you honor that? I believe that Christians can make Christians, don't you? That's the law of biogenesis, isn't it? Life comes from life. Well, save people, save people, just like hurt people, hurt people. Save people, save people. Each one, reach one, and teach one. That's the plan. I believe that works. You know why I believe that? First of all, because God said it. You know why I secondarily, the second reason I believe that? I see it happen all the time. I'm blessed to be in the church that I'm a part of. There's a lot of that going on. It works. I believe in God's plan for leadership in the church. I believe in elders. I believe that's a first principles issue. I believe it's super important. You believe that? Make it known. Make it known you believe it. Put your feet where your prayers are. Do everything you can do in that way and honor God. Honor Him and show your faith in Him by doing the things that He says we can. 
And show them that we just take him seriously. What do you do when you take something seriously? Let me give you a little example. You're driving down the road. And you've never been someplace. And you're trying to find this place. And you've gone as far as you're familiar with. And now you're getting into the unfamiliar part. If the radio's on and playing music, what do you do? Mm-hmm. You turn that thing down, don't you? Or you turn it off altogether. Why? Because you've got to concentrate. What you've just done is a classic example of how people take things seriously. They reduce distractions and interferences and they focus on the thing at hand. If we're going to think big, what we've got to do is reduce some of the distractions. Your favorite show can wait. Your hobby will still be there when you're done doing the Lord's things. The toys that you want and the stuff you want to play with and all of that stuff, it's going to burn up when this world burns up. And your heritage will be with the Lord. Now, where are you laying up treasure? Get serious and take Him seriously and reduce some of those distractions and get to work. Do you have one night a week that you can just give to the Lord? Whatever that means, whether it's visiting the sick or going out and trying to talk to your neighbors or restoring somebody who's lost in the Lord. Do you have one night a week you can do that? I'm talking about three or four hours. I'm not even talking about the whole night. I, go ahead and eat supper with your family or by yourself or whatever you prefer. You may need to eat by yourself if you want to concentrate, you know. Do that and then give four hours to the Lord a week. Can you do that? Can you do that? You can do that. Whether you think you can or not, you absolutely can. And when it's all said and done, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give God the glory for whatever happens. Because what we're going to remember is that big things happen only because God makes them happen. Not because of us. And I'm going to give Him the credit. And I'm going to recognize it. I could not have done that without the Lord. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that out loud. I'm going to say it to you. And when people start giving us credit for me, say, oh, you're just great. You're just wonderful. You people are so... You say the Lord's wonderful. The Lord is great. That's who's great. We're just following His lead. I am a beggar showing the other beggars where to find the bread. That's all in the world I am. He's great. I don't much care for cats. But I tell you, I love this picture up here because it really portrays perfectly the way cats think. You see this? Thanks. Thank. Um, you see this kitty cat up here? You see the shadow on the wall? It's a lion. That's the, way, that's the way cats are. They have forgotten that they're domesticated little things living in your house. They're still the king of the savannah as far as they're concerned. They just, have you brought me anything to eat? I don't think I'll let you pet me, but if you'll stand there, I'll rub against you. Okay. I like the way they think. Because even though it's not really necessarily tied to reality, it's tied to the heritage. And it may not be true right this minute. But it can be. This is the Lord's church. We're not just saying that to distinguish us from denominations. This is the Lord's church. It belongs to Him. And in order for that to be completely true, it has to do what He wants us to do. Are we willing to do whatever the Lord wants us to do? Then we better think big. Because He's got big plans for this church. The very first thing He thinks of is anybody who's lost. And there are people in this audience, I'm confident, who fall in that description. Maybe you've been thinking about obeying the gospel and you haven't. I don't know why you haven't. I don't know what's holding you back. But if you recognize the difference between you being baptized tonight and not being baptized, that if you got killed in a car accident out here, you'd go to hell because you weren't baptized, then you need to be baptized tonight. Now, you don't need to know much more than that. Now, if you do understand that and you're ready to do it, we're ready to help you do that. 
if you don't know what that means, and that sounds like Greek to you, it just sounds crazy, I want you to come forward anyway, and I want you to tell us, explain what you're talking about. We'll study that. We'll talk about it tonight. We'll get it straight. But whatever the need might be, you need to get it right with the Lord tonight. If we can help you with that, don't you know we're ready and we're eager and willing to do that. So why don't you come right now as we stand and sing.